All right, so let's look at question eight here. And this is really now, we're, we're getting into the meat of what it is that we're trying to do in this class. So I know, uh, especially now that we're doing it online and things are, are kind of here and there, uh, you don't get to see me and see the emphasis that I'm placing on particular things, right? So um, if we were having this class in person, in terms of the total amount of time devoted to questions like these, you'd see it's much larger uh, than what you kind of see in these bits and pieces that are posted online. Uh, but if you look at this question and the questions that follow, I'm placing a lot of emphasis on being able to understand how changes in our environment, um, changes in TFP, changes in capital, uh, other types of events are going to affect macroeconomic variables, such as real GDP, employment, the real wage, um, and all of those good things, investment, consumption, all of these types of variables were interested in macroeconomics. So question eight is getting at that. So here we go. So we've got a permanent increase in TFP, total factor productivity. How does this affect our variables? And show how this impact differs from the case where the change in TFP is only going to be temporary. And explain your results. So let me kind of jump over here and we'll, we'll explain a little bit um, a difference between a a permanent change and a temporary change. So a temporary change in TFP really means that the current TFP, total factor productivity, is going to increase. So that means that Z is going to increase but there's no change that we can expect in Z prime, which is our future TFP. So remember, what is TFP? Is it tells us how good we are at combining existing capital and labor to produce output. So the higher that TFP is, the better I am at combining capital and labor to produce output. So a good way to think of this is to compare Jimmy John's to Urban and Gerber's. Right, so you may have been to, to either one of those. Now, from the outside, right, they have base, they have the same capital, they both have a store, uh, they have you know the same equipment there, and they have labor, they have roughly the same number of people working at any point in time. If you ordered a, a sandwich from Jimmy John's, uh, in a given amount of time, they're going to produce way more sandwiches than Herbert and Gerbert's is, right? And so that is an increase in their TFP. And in the case of Jimmy John's, right, that's really a permanent change or a permanent increase in their TFP. No matter what, today and in the future, they're going to be able to produce more sandwiches than Herbert and Gerbert's, given the same capital and labor. Their TFP is just higher. Now, a temporary change would be a non-permanent difference, right? So it could be that for whatever reason, all of a sudden, Jimmy John sees more people coming into their store than they would normally, or Herbert and Gerbert's. And so for the current period, we're just making more sandwiches because we have more people coming through, but that's not expected to last, right? So the, both places right now have a temporary decrease in TFP because not as many people are coming through the store. So we've got our capital and labor. We just can't make as many sandwiches because people don't want to buy sandwiches. But that's temporary. That should go away. So that hopefully example gives you a little better insight into what's temporary and what's permanent. And in this question, we're asking the permanent case, right? What if we get the Jimmy John's innovation in sandwich production so that we're more productive now and in the future? How is that going to impact our macroeconomy? We have a permanent increase in our ability to combine capital and labor to produce output. Well, the best way to start these the way that I like to do this is I'm always going to draw my labor market, employment, and the real wage. So employment, start here at N1, into W1. So we're going to want to track through changes in employment. And then I'm also potentially going to want to keep track of investment where we had simply the investment demand curve. 
as a function of the real interest rate. So remember, we got that with this relationship. There's a bunch of questions that go through where does investment demand come from. So now you can kind of see the payoff to understanding those earlier questions is it's going to help us answer these questions, which are really the meat of what we're trying to do. Uh, and then I also want to draw what I call my goods market, which is our output supply and output demand. So here we are, we start off in equilibrium at R1 and Y1. And we have a temporary, or sorry, a permanent increase in TFP. So both Z and Z prime increase. Now when we become permanently more productive, there's, there's two main effects that we need to keep track of. So first of all, the increase in Z is going to increase labor demand. Labor demand goes up when Z goes up because our workers are more productive today. So Jimmy John's is going to hire more workers than Urban and Gerberts. Why? Because those workers are more productive for a given amount of capital than they are at Urban and Gerberts. So labor demand is going to shift to the right. And if you go back to how did we get output supply, it came from that labor market. So now we're saying at every R, I'm going to have more employment and more output. That is an increase in output supply. For every R, I have more output supply. So a good tip to remember is generally speaking, any change that initiates in the labor market causes a shift in labor demand or a change in labor supply per interest rate is going to affect output supply. So if my first change is in the labor market as a result of some change in the economy, that's going to move output supply in basically the same direction that employment goes in the labor market. So the change in Z increases output supply. Z prime is going to affect the future marginal product of capital and it's going to increase it. Right, so I'm more productive in the future. That's going to make my capital more productive in the future and therefore is going to increase investment demand. So investment demand is going to increase And that means that every real interest rate, we're going to demand more output. So output demand is also going to increase. Now, if I draw that exactly the same response, I get no change in the real interest rate. So I don't know exactly what's going to happen to R here. So YD goes up. But I know for sure that real GDP is going to increase. So R, I don't know. But I know for sure real GDP has to go up. Both shifts want to increase real GDP. If the change in output demand was bigger, that would cause R to go up. If the change in output supply was bigger, that would cause R to go down. So it just depends. And I don't really care which way you go with it as long as you tell me what it is that's going on. So as long as everything you do is consistent with your answer from here on out, I'm okay with that. Uh, in my case, it, I drew it as they cancel out. That's a bit easier because I don't get any change in, in labor supply then as a result. If R stays the same, I know that employment goes up and the real wage goes up. Employment goes up, the real wage goes up, and in investment, R stayed the same. And so I know for sure that investment is going to increase. So basically everything across the board is, is increasing as a result of a permanent increase in TFP. That makes sense. We become more productive. We have better technology for combining capital and labor. 
we're going to produce more stuff. Demand and supply are increasing, and so we get more of everything. Now, the other part of that question is, how is that different if it's only a temporary increase rather than permanent? So if it's temporary, that means that only we get the increase in Z, which means we only get the shift in output supply. So I'm just going to redraw my markets here. So I have my labor market. I have investment. Start us off at our, wherever we are here at R1, we have some investment. And then our, our goods market, output demand and output supply. And we start in equilibrium, Y1 and R1. And so what we see here is if it's only temporary, we just get the increase in output supply. And so we still get an increase in GDP, but obviously it's much smaller because we didn't get the increase in output demand. So real GDP goes up, but by less. That makes sense, right? We're not as, as productive as before. We shouldn't get as big of an increase in real GDP. Now, oh, sorry, I forgot to shift labor demand up front. That's what caused the shift in output supply. And so now the real interest rate goes down, which implies we get um, a slight change in labor supply. Labor supply is gonna decrease slightly when the real interest rate goes down. So that's an important point to remember is anytime the real interest rate changes, you wanna go back and kind of uh, dot your I's and cross your T's, so to speak, which is to make the changes in the labor market and your investment demand graph. So here we get a small decrease in labor supply, but overall employment goes up, just not as much as the case before in this case. And we still get the increase in the real wage. So not much is different there in the labor market. A few small differences, but, but not a whole lot. Because the change in the labor market and the permanent change was all due to the increase in Z. So there's not much difference there. Um, but since the real interest rate goes down, we also get an increase in investment. It's just not as big. Right, so the responses are, are roughly similar. It's just in general that the changes are much smaller, especially with respect to investment and output. So these were a couple of examples. Uh, again, as with everything else, I encourage you to, to, to spend the time to draw these out yourself. Uh, the more you draw these in practice, the more it becomes second nature, the easier it will be to answer these questions uh, mistake-free on the exam.